So without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for this evening, Dan Kahan. Um, so those who work in the field of climate change, in just about any aspect of it, um, are frustrated when they puzzle the, the, you know, the question, why doesn't the rest of the world get it? You know, why doesn't the general public really understand that climate change, you know, what we're doing to the planet, you know, really is the defining challenge uh, of the 21st century. And most of us, if we think about it at all, we sort of search our experience, you know, scratch our heads, and concoct, concoct some type of anecdotal explanation for this. And usually my sort of anecdotal evidence for the anecdotal explanations are, is that they usually amount to blaming Fox News uh, or blaming Al Gore. Um, if you're familiar with Dan and his work, you'll know that he actually studies these problems and looks for hard evidence. You know, what really is at the base uh, of, these, of these opinions and these you know, sometimes firmly held <coughs> beliefs? And it's not just on the area of climate change. It's related to climate, I'm sorry, to science in general and the communication of science. Uh, so, for example, he has studied issues related to why do people go against conventional wisdom, overwhelming you know, <coughs> medical evidence, and refuse to have their children vaccinated. And there are a whole host of questions like this that he studies in connection with something that he and his colleagues call the Cultural Cognition Project. And they describe this as an international team of scholars who use empirical methods to examine the impact of group values on perceptions of risk and related facts. Uh, before coming to Yale, uh, Dan was on the faculty at the University of Chicago School of Law. He also uh, clerked for Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. But I have to say that the most fascinating fact that appears on the internet regarding Dan appears on his website. Uh, it's a uh, final sentence, short sentence, uh, on one of his web pages. It says, and he has a very bad cat. <laughs> I dare not ask. <laughs> so Dan is the Elizabeth K. Dollard Professor of Law and Professor of Psychology at Yale School of Law, and he's going to talk to us about the topic on the screen. So Dan, welcome. Thank you. Yes. Unfortunately, my cat destroyed um, my, my slides, and so I'm not able to give this talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, it's a, it's a, a tremendous uh, uh, honor to be asked to uh, be here and address uh, address you. Um, it, it's it's uh, just a remarkable uh, uh, assembly of people um, in a position uh, to address what uh, the the energy uh, uh, needs and opportunities um, are of the of our future. Um, and, and it's a little bit awkward, of course, because I don't know uh, anything um, about uh, energy. I, mean, I don't know anything about. Uh, nuclear power or, or solar power. I, I mean, I dabble a little bit in cold fusion, um, just like everybody else. Um, but really, I, I don't know. I think maybe that's why I was on the, the program uh, for this evening and not for tomorrow. But, but uh, actually, Mark, um, who's, who's not here, said, well, you, know, you, you really should speak here, um, even though you don't know anything um, about energy. And you should speak at the beginning, because uh, what you do know, um, or at least what you study, um, and, and people who uh, are approaching uh, uh, this field in the way that you are know is of tremendous significance and consequence um, for the people who, who don't, do know <laughs> what it is we need to know about uh, energy technologies um, and the future. Um, in fact, he said uh, that uh, the, 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 the value <laughs> um, of, of what we can achieve um, with the knowledge that we have um, about um, new uh, alternative forms of, of energy uh, really does depend <laughs> on uh, connecting, well, not the knowledge that I personally have, but the knowledge of people who study uh, science communication um, and study it in, in a scientific way um, with the knowledge that you have, um, with the knowledge that scientists have with the knowledge uh, that policymakers who use science have. That's essential uh, to realize the value of that. So I said, okay, I would come. And he didn't come. Um, but, but that's, I'll, I'll, I think he's right. Um, and I'm going to try to make you believe that. But uh, I have already talked too long without showing uh, some data. 
Um, <laughs> so here's some data. Uh, th this is a scatter plot um, of, of uh, the responses from a general population uh, survey in the United States from last summer, a repre nationally representative survey, and we're, we're asking, what do you think about the risk of climate change? So that's the kind of scale, zero to seven, that's on the, the, the Y axis, of course. And they're arrayed uh, along the X axis according to their political outlooks, right? So you, you ask them what their uh, party identification is with a scale of zero to seven, what their ideology is, liberal conservative, zero to five. You can put those together and you have a kind of a scale, an index of what their right left political orientations are. And I think you can, you can see what the, the, the relationship is. Maybe if you want to see a, a, a plotted regression line, there you go. But you know, we're running from those kind of hot colors, the climate change hot, on the extreme left liberal down to the colder colors for the conservatives. And that, that's a pretty strong correlation. I mean, you know, is R equals 0 0.65. You have to kind of think about these things in connection with some benchmark. But the correlation between being a, a conservative Republican and uh, being a conservative and being a Republican is about 0.65. So the connection between the, the people's positions on this issue is the same as the connection between what they say their ideology is and what their party affiliation is. If I wanted to, I could add that and have that as a third item in my scale. It would only make it more reliable and I'd be even better at predicting what people's views are on issues like abortion or Obamacare, right? That's how deep the connection is between people's political outlooks and climate change. Now, the nice thing about this measure, it, it, what do you think of climate change on a scale of zero to seven? It doesn't, there's no right answer, you see, but you use it to measure variance because it turns out that there's about a 0.9 correlation between what people will say here and what they'll say about anything else you ask them related to climate change, including is it happening, right? Are humans causing it? Will this or that bad consequence occur as a result? So if you look at what explains the variance in people's answers to this question, how serious do you think the risk of climate change is, you're really measuring what their attitudes are, what their beliefs are about facts relating to climate change. So we're polarized, you see, on the basic facts. And of course, you all know this already. But, but, and I don't know, maybe you know this too. We, we look at the relationship between people's perceptions of climate change risk, their beliefs about the, the facts, the ones that admit of scientific investigation and climate change, and their comprehension of science. And you can measure that in various kinds of ways. Right, so here's a scale that has components that they scale nicely. They measure basically a disposition to acquire scientific knowledge. Uh, how much scientific knowledge do you have? What kinds of critical reasoning dispositions uh, do you have that allow you to assimilate empirical evidence and so forth? And, and what's the relationship? Well, you know, it looks like there's none between people's level of science comprehension and their perceptions of climate change risk. That, that's completely misleading. This is a very, very important, significant reaction. If you're somebody whose political outlooks are to the left of center, just divide the population in half using my index, then as you become more science comprehending, you will become more concerned about climate change, more likely to believe that the earth is heating up, that humans are causing that by burning fossil fuels, that it has certain kinds of consequences. But if you're to the right of center, then you're less likely to believe all of those things. Right? So the degree of polarization that exists among people who are modest in science comprehension, it only grows. Right? It's more intense among the people who are in the best position to understand science. Right? And I'm going to call this the science communication problem. Right? This is an instance of it. The problem is the, the persistence of uh, bitter political division over risks, uh, other kinds of policy relevant facts um, that n not only admit of scientific investigation, but have in fact been the object of scientific inquiry of the most uh, compelling kind that in fact are uh, uh, ones on which information has been widely disseminated. Well, it's, it's what we started out with. What's the problem? here, and th this isn't the only instance of this, 
right? I, it, I could show you nuclear power, and actually a lot of the, the work that uh, I do builds on research that started in the 1970s, where I explain why there was this conflict between members of the public and experts on nuclear power. HPV vaccine is another contemporary example, right? So we have this science communication problem. It, it's the persistence of this division in the face of the evidence, and it, it's the existence of a, a kind of magnification of conflict as people actually become more science comprehending, right? Now, here's, here's another example of this, right? Fracking. Now, actually, I don't know, people, fracking, I don't think we know nearly as much about the risks of fracking as we know about the risks of climate change. Right? People are just starting to study these things, and they should, right? And it's kind of remarkable that people are already this kind of divided about it. But it's not just remarkable, it, it's very disturbing. It doesn't matter what you think about fracking, because it doesn't matter if things are like this, what it is we ever do find out. If you have an issue like this, then information that we have that's valid, that's compelling, is not going to dispel political conflict. Right? It's not going to create convergence among the people who know the most and are in the best position to understand it and can explain it to others. It's going to drive them apart. Right? And so you see, we want to understand the science communication problem. It's actually kind of mysterious if you think about it. If that makes it interesting, why not study it? But it's also tremendously <laughs> inimical to our welfare because no matter what we find out on an issue, if it has this kind of profile, the likelihood that we'll assimilate it into our decision making is low. Right? And so, yeah, I think what I'm trying to understand is a vital consequence to realizing the value of what scientists do, what you do. And I try to understand why you have this problem and use scientific methods, empirical methods to, to do so. All right, so uh, I'll, I'll four points here. Talk, first, start with the, something, that my explanation, a theory, a cultural cognition thesis, an explanation for the science communication problem, give you some evidence. Right? It's not just storytelling. Right? And then so, something that, that synthesizes it. Yeah, it's, the tragedy and not the comedy of the science communications commons and the, and the kind of prescription about protecting the science communication environment. Right, so start with the cultural cognition thesis. And, and basically, the idea is just that uh, you can expect people uh, to form and persist in perceptions of at least certain kinds of, of risk and other policy consequential facts that reflect and reinforce their commitment to certain kinds of really important identifying groups. Right? And, and that is a, a, a way to describe a more general phenomenon, motivated reasoning. Right? Cultural cognition is an instance of motivated reasoning. Motivated reasoning is where people uh, uh, fit their understanding of all manner of information. Uh, it might be scientific data. It might be logical arguments. It, it might be what they see with their own eyes. To some goal or interest, that is independent of extracting the truth from that information. And, and the classic study was a, a 1950s one that the researchers used college students. It was appropriate in this case. It's called They Saw a Game. Right? So they asked the, the undergraduates from two Ivy League schools to watch a tape of a football game between their institution. The referee made some controversial calls. Just watch the tape and see if he got the right call. Right? So all the students. It wasn't Yale students because they would have, wouldn't have worried. All the Dartmouth students who watched it said, oh, you know, what's wrong? The referee, you know, he must have been on the payroll of Penn or something like that. And the Penn students, what's going on? Is he a Dartmouth alum and so forth, right? So this is motivated reasoning. reasoning that the emotional stake that the students have in forming judgments about this important event involving their group that reflect their commitment to this group, that express their solidarity, is influencing what they see, you see. So the cultural cognition thesis is, well, similar thing is happening. People are making sense of any and all kinds of information about climate change and these other issues that display this profile in a way that connects them to their groups. Right? And what are the groups? You, know, you could define them in lots of different ways. Obviously, political affiliations are a group, right? but, but we, do, we, we use a different scheme. <laughs> I'll tell you why if you like, but it's a, it's a little bit more nuanced. And we get this from, from Mary Douglas. We call it the cultural cognition 
thesis because she had the theory developed with a, a along with an anthropologist along with a political scientist, Aaron Waldowski, the cultural theory of risk. And, and Mary Douglas said, you can characterize people's worldviews, they're just preferences about how society or other kinds of uh, groups should be organized uh, along these two cross-cutting dimensions, right? how individualistic, how communitarian, how hierarchical, or how egalitarian, fairly straightforward concepts. And the idea was, well, people are going to uh, form perceptions of risk that reflect and reinforce their commitment to one or another group whose outlooks can be characterized according to this kind of framework. Right? And, and so, you're, oh, the people who are more hierarchical and individualistic, they're going to be more skeptical about, well, nuclear power was really what she was talking about. And the egalitarian communitarians, they, they think that markets are the source of all kinds of injustice. So they want to see commerce, market, and industry as causing harm. And so they don't like nuclear. It's kind of a controversial book, you see. But you, 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 we can find these kinds of correlations measuring people's outlooks with scales uh, that, that uh, indicate or reliably measure that there's something in them. That, well, they seem to have these kinds of outlooks. And there are these correlations. Uh, and, and there are lots of them, not just with, with climate change, but with all the kinds of, of well, really controversial issues, the, 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 the big hot button ones, the kinds of ones, you know, you, you're in a talk with somebody uh, you don't know, you try to steer away from it because you really don't want to annoy anybody. Okay. <laughs> But we, we call this cultural because that's our understanding of what the, the relevant groups are here that, that are the source of the motivation. The, these groups that are defined with reference to the values that, that, that correspond to the two by two are to our research what the school affiliations were to the, the subjects, the students, and they saw a gain, right? But we say cognition. I mean, I told you a little story about the egalitarian. I don't want stories. I want to know what are the psychological mechanisms that connect commitment to these kinds of groups and these kinds of outlooks. And so I'll tell you, give you an example of some studies here. One is on scientific consensus. Right? And obviously, this is at the core of the science communication problem. If we have scientific consensus, why is there political conflict on these issues? And we do, we do an experiment here. What we did, we show people these, these scientists. Right, you can see that they're, they're, they're all scientists, of course. And, well, one of them went to a great institution. And two of them are pretty good one. And it's, it's my contract that you got that on the, the film. Um, that they're, they're, all, they're all members of National Academy of Sciences. It's pretty, pretty impressive. They all are working in these, these areas. Areas, well, uh, global warming, nuclear power, gun control. And we're saying to the subjects, just ordinary members of the public, do these seem like experts to you? I mean, if somebody, a friend of yours, was trying to make up his or her mind on this issue, do you think it would make sense for that person to read a book, say, by somebody like this? This person likely to get, know what the heck he, he's talking about, right? And we picked these, these issues because we knew that people who have these kinds of, of group affiliations that we measure are, are divided on what the risks of nuclear power and climate change and also carrying concealed weapons that make crime go up because there's too many guns around, maybe it makes crime go down. You know, if everybody's carrying, I'm going to be on my best behavior. I don't, don't want to piss you off. You might be carrying a gun. Right? And we're giving them, you know, here, here are these people's experts on that? <laughs> and we tell half the subjects that the featured scientist has taken what we call the high-risk position for climate change. It's beyond scientific dispute, scientific consensus. It's happening, caused by humans. Bad things will happen. Low risk, too early to say. Computer models are fallible. Need more information. Right? Same geologic nuclear waste, very dangerous. You know, you can do that perfectly safely. Or conceal weapons. You know, crime's going to go up, crime's going to go down. And the answer then that people get to the question is this: a, a, a expert depends on what the correlation is between the position we're attributing to the scientist and the cultural outlooks of the subject who's answering the question. Right. So if you're if you're an egalitarian communitarian and that scientist you saw is saying, yes, climate change is happening. It's a 54 percent point increase in the likelihood relative to a high curl individual. Say, oh, yeah, that's an expert. But if you're the or if you're a high curl individualist and he says it's not happening, 54 percent, 72 percent point more likely to the egalitarian communitarian to say, no, you know, he, he's not an expert if he, he is shown to be taking the position on climate change that it's low risk. And you get similar big effect sizes on these other issues. Now, you see, 
This is like they saw a game. These, these members of, of, of groups who have these kinds of outlooks are divided on these issues. And they understand that this is something that divides others. And they're being shown some evidence here. You know, evidence of what it, somebody who you might think, well, knows what he's talking about. It, well, it depends, right? You, you see that person as having uh, information that should be credited by others. If it's the doing so, it's supportive of what your group says, but not otherwise. You see, I mean, you know, this is not Bayesian reasoning. You, you update your priors based on the new information. Here, we're, we're using what we already believe to judge the weight of the evidence, whether this person knows what he's talking about. Of course, we use he, white males. I don't know, maybe these groups have different ideas about who, who should be, have authority based on gender and race, but I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to control for that, right? Show them the same person. And if that's the way the world works, you see, then these people are going to be divided not only on the risk, but on what scientists say. And, and that's true. None of the people in these groups think that scientific consensus is inconsistent with the one that predominates in their group. Right? And you know what happens? You just say to them, well, you know, well what do most scientists think? You know, well, let's see, every, every expert I ever saw said this. <laughs> you know, yeah, because you were engaged in biased sampling. You're excluding from your count, essentially, people who don't have the position that your group espouses. Oh, he's not an expert on that or, or, or some, so forth. And people end up polarized. And they are right, on these kinds of issues. Here's another kind of explanation would be, maybe there's a group out there that hates scientists. You know, they don't think we should listen to scientists. No, that's not these groups. In fact, it's not anybody that has much influence in our culture. They all think, you, of course, do what scientists say you should do, but they're divided on that. Neither of them is very good either at figuring out what scientific consensus is. We pick these issues because the National Academy of Sciences has issued consensus reports on each one of these issues. And each group is right about 33% of the time. Right? The group that's right on the climate change, wrong on nuclear power, both wrong about guns. And National Academy, said, you just can't tell. The evidence is inconclusive, no scientific consensus. It's not what these groups think. So it's not that, what, do you think one of these groups is better than the others at figuring out what the scientists think? Well, then you have to think it's better, too, than the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, that's one possibility. The other possibility is neither is very good, that they're doing what we said in our experiment, which is conforming what they see to the interests that they have in persisting in the view that their group is right. Now, one thing on which they all agree, you can figure out whether climate change is happening by just considering what the weather has been like recently. Right? There are many polls that show that what people have experienced the weather to be like will predict whether they think climate change is happening. But my, my co-author, Hank Jenkins-Smith, who has worked on me with in the last study, did, he showed that what predicts what people think the local weather has been recently is not what the local weather has been in their area. <laughs> It's their cultural outlooks. If they are egalitarian, communitarian, the group that's predisposed to believe in climate change, they think it's been awfully hot the last few years in their zip code. And if they're a hierarchical individual, they think it's really been quite cold, right? So, you know, if your air conditioner goes out this summer, just tell yourself, well, you know, it is the case that the death penalty deters murder, and maybe it'll happen. Yeah. Now, we do work in Florida. Actually, is the extension of the, we're, we're, it, here I, I've done this now using our, our scheme and some of these superimposed uh, 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 histograms. You can see you know, that, that that's kind of a bipolar distribution. There, a bimodal distribution, and, and the the, the uh, increased magnification, the magnification of the polarization, conditional on science comprehension. And this is actually just a, a replication of a of a study that we did in Nature of Climate Change. And it, it, the same thing is going on in Florida, right? I mean, so Florida, which is kind of on the frontier of climate impacts for the United States, well, same thing. But we also looked at just uh, how, how uh, had they already been affected by adverse uh, weather events, the kind of adverse <laughs> events index, how often you had to evacuate your residents, uh, your residents have been damaged by a flood, you know, did you ever lose access to water and so forth? Insurance rates go up. That, we had to throw that one out because everybody said yes in Florida, right? But, but you know, I don't know about, about three and a half of these bad events have happened. People in, in these four counties, uh, Monroe County, which is the Keys, right? Broward, Miami-Dade, West Palm Beach, they're all the southeast counties, the ones that get hit by the hurricanes, right? And we want to know, well, does this have an effect on their understanding of whether climate change is happening, the perception of the risk, right? 
what do you think is going to happen? As people experience more of these adverse events, will they become more concerned, less concerned? He thinks it's a trick question. <laughs> more, more, concerned. more concerned. See, hmm? Anybody else? Well, it's a trick question. I mean, you know, but I thought you would try to trick me by saying, oh, nothing happens, right? <laughs> but I would say, no, that's a trick question. It only looks like nothing's happening. If you become, if you're a more egalitarian communitarian, you become more concerned as more bad things are happening to you in Florida. But if you're a hierarchical individualist, it, as the bad things happen to you, it doesn't have any impact, you see. So, you know, the hurricane comes in and it knocks down the two houses from the guys across the street from each other. Yeah, first guy comes running out of his house and he says, you see, I told you, climate change is going to happen, we didn't do anything, now look at my house. And then the guy says, well, what are you talking about? So I told you, if we had gay marriage, this was going to happen. <laughs> right? You know something, they both have equal science comprehension. Uh, you know, th this is another one. <laughs> Here, you see, this is actually another, another hypothesis about the science communication problem, that people don't actually process information about risk in a systematic, conscious, analytic way, the way scientists do, right? Slow system, true. They, they, they do rely on kind of affective, intuitive, heuristic-driven processes, and therefore they overestimate more dramatic risks like the risk of terrorism relative to more consequential cares about the polar bear. It makes sense. This is a real mechanism, but you know, more things are plausible than are true. That's why you collect data. You see, and this theory predicts, for one thing, that as people then experience these kinds of more emotionally compelling things, like their house getting smashed down by a hurricane, or having to evacuate, or losing their water, then they'll start to pay attention. Well, no, it's not true. And it's not that surprising, because you can observe the consequences, but you're not observing the cause. Right? What made this happen, climate change, or you know, God matter, any, just anything else, you have to rely on somebody else to tell you why things like this happen, and then that's evidence that that's how the world works. That's where the cultural cognition comes in, you see. Now, the theory that we have a, a kind of defect in, in public rationality explains climate change also predicts, of course, you know, that, that, that as people become better at assimilating information, as they become more disposed to use the kind of analytic dispositions associated with the slow, conscious evaluation essential to make sense of, of scientific information on risk, then they should become more concerned. And I've already basically shown you that, that that's not true. So that's evidence that tends to count against that thesis, too. It's consistent with the cultural cognition thesis. I mean, we would think, well, we would predict people are going to use their ability to make sense of information to satisfy the stake that they have in forming and persisting in the positions that connect them to their group. And that would fit this, you see. But, but this is observational data. Let's do an experiment and see if we can catch the, these critical reasoning dispositions in the act. Right, so here's a, a study we recently did and we said to people, those scientists, we all love them. We do, you know, the United States loves scientists. All these groups, they think scientists are great. You, you come home, I'm going to marry a scientist, mom. You're like, great. You know, I'm going to marry a lawyer. What the hell is wrong with you? You know, something <laughs> like this. They're scientists, and we love them because they do things like create skin rash creams. They've done that. But here's the thing, you know, sometimes the skin rash goes away by itself. Sometimes it gets, you know, so, sometimes actually the skin cream can make it worse. You've got to test these things. So here's some, some data. Right? The scientists gave the skin cream to some people who had a rash and didn't give it to others. And little, how many got better who got the rash? How many got better who didn't get it? And, and you'll see right away, right? is it working or not? You'll go, oh, it's not working, <laughs> you know, because you can see that the people who got the skin cream, well, they're about three times more likely to get better. But the people who didn't, they're about five times more likely to get better. So you right, right away, you got that. Because this is a two-by-two two contingency table. This is how you establish whether there's a correlation. Right? That's what this is about. Can you, can you recognize covariance? Right? And most people can't. They look at this, and they use a heuristic. They say, hey, more people who got the treatment got better than worse. It works. Right? 
And then the slightly smarter ones say, hey, also, you know, not only more people who got it got better than got worse, the people who didn't get it, fewer of them got better. It works, right? And that's not right. You've got to use all the information. That's why we had the two-by-two two contingency, right? And you tell this to people afterwards. It's not that they didn't get the math or they don't understand that you have to look at the disconfirming as well as the confirming evidence. Say, oops, you know, I won't do that again. You will do that again, because this is, <laughs> this is a great problem for measuring whether you have a certain kind of disposition to recognize that you need to use this kind of, of reasoning to make a causal inference. Right? Now, we have another version of the experiment. Same, those scientists, this time they, they, they looked at the cities, some of which adopted a gun ban, some of which didn't. They wanted to see crime going up or down. And we, we changed the headings on the, we call, this, we call these experimental manipulations, I'm not sure why. But you, you, you change the headings on the columns so that half the subjects, will, or one quarter for each of the, but half the people who see one version of it will see the, the, the table where if the data are properly construed, the rash is getting better or, or, or crime is going down. The other half see the, the information in the form in which, oh, well, you know, the, the crime is going up and, and the rash is getting worse. And you want to see how people do. And, and so here's the data. Now I actually look at this. It's a raw data, but you, basically people are getting it right, people are getting it wrong, you know, different colors. You know, had, well, we look at their numeracy, which is a... a, 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 a an ability not just do math, but to reason with quantitative information in an appropriate, reliable way and make inferences from it that are actually valid. Right? And here you see, as people are getting higher in numeracy, they're more likely to get the right answer about the skin cream, right? no matter which condition they're in. But they're low in numeracy, they're likely to get it wrong. It's a hard problem. You've got to be about with an 85th percentile before you're, you're much more likely to get it right than not. Right? Great test. It's probably on the SAT, so you probably already saw it. Right? Now, here's what happens with the gun ban. Right? It looks weird. There's some noise in there. Right? <laughs> That's cultural cognition. Here we're, we're measuring people's political outlooks. You can do it that way if you want. It's just another way to measure what these dispositions are. And if you look at the skin rash version of the treatment, those high partisan uh, subjects, it doesn't matter what what their political affiliation or outlook is, they're getting it right, but not the ones who are low, right, in numeracy. When it comes to the gun ban, right? people are getting the answer right if they're high in numeracy, if the data properly construed re supports the conclusion that's consistent with the one that corresponds with their ideology. Right? Uh, otherwise, they're doing no better than their low numeracy counterparts. This is funny to you. You think this is funny, right? I'll make you laugh. <laughs> the, it's not funny, you see? This isn't funny, I, 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 it's cool, but you know, you, you, people just show you this kind of thing. Oh, look at this, look at my, you know. Actually, I, let's make some, you, know, you gotta graphically present these things the way a climate scientist do. They do a Monte Carlo simulate, you do. Otherwise, when somebody shows you that, they're just trying to intimidate you. What does this mean? You know, I'll show you what it means. I'm gonna simulate, you know, what the likelihood is. Take a thousand, do a Monte Carlo simulation, a thousand people who have, say, a, 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 a a uh, liberal outlook, one standard deviation from the mean in favor of liberalism, and who are low in numeracy. What would they do in the skin rash treatment? Thousand people who are conservatives in low numeracy, and, and they'll fill out a probability distribution, and you can look at it. No, they, they're not doing so well, but they're all kind of clumped together. Now let's look at the high numeracy ones, right? They're all doing much better. They're pretty clumped together. There doesn't seem to be much difference. And now you look at the gun ban, right? If, I'm, if I were polling a thousand people like this, well, there's polarization. Right? And the interesting thing is that the, the degree of, of disagreement, the, the difference in how likely people are to get the right answer, it's lower for the low numeracy partisans than for the high numeracy partisans, right? And both, both of these treatments for the gun, right? There's about a, a difference of 25 percentage points in how likely somebody is to get the answer right, right? If, if it's kind of contrary to their view for the low numeracy partisans, about 46% difference in the the likelihood. 46% is more likely to get it if it's consistent with your ideology than not if you're high in, in numeracy, right? Well, what, what's happening? The, the people with high in numeracy, you see, they're smart and they recognize when the evidence is consistent with their view and they get it, right? The low numeracy people, they're just as partisan, but they don't even see. They can't, they're trying. They, they can't see as readily that the, the information supports their view. Now, when the information doesn't support their view, 
Well, then you see these same high numeracy people, they use that same critical reasoning ability to, to pop open a, a confabulatory escape hatch to the logic trap. Oh, there's something wrong with that study. Maybe there is, but they only see it when it's inconsistent with their view. If that's the way the world works, and it could do this with culture too, you're gonna see this, right? Those people who are high in critical reasoning are more divided because they're using their critical reasoning abilities in this opportunistic way. That's what the, the cultural cognition thesis, but not the others would predict. And this, now the, the, the tragedy of the science communication is common. It's not a comedy, right? You see, it, th th this problem, this kind of division on issues that admit of, science, of, of fact, factual empirical investigation that, that become worse as people become more science comprehending, that's not a problem, obviously, with too little rationality. That's too much. You see, people are too good at extracting from information on these issues the significance that helps them align with their groups. And that's a rational thing to do because it doesn't matter what any individual, ordinary person at least, I don't know if you're a Koch brother, or ordinary individual doesn't matter what they think about climate change. They don't matter enough as a consumer, as a voter, as somebody making arguments to have an impact on what the policy is or to have an impact on carbon emission mitigation and so forth, even if they decide not to you know, go completely carbon free. If they make a mistake based on the science in any of those capacities, nobody gets hurt. It doesn't change the risk for them or anybody they care about. Make a mistake though about climate change, given what it signifies about who you are for people who care, who are like you, that could be very bad. If I go out right now with a big sign that says, you know, it's a hoax. Even with 10 year, my life is gonna suck, you know? <laughs> You know Bob Inglis, the most conservative congressman in history, right? If Fourth District in South Carolina gets knocked out of office by a Tea Party challenger. Why? Because he said he believes in climate change, right? So you're Floyd the barber in the Fourth District of South Carolina, and now the guy comes in for the shave, straight razor, or something. Sign my petition on polar bears before you leave. You know, you're out of a job as quickly as Bob Inglis. Not a good idea, you see? And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know what kinds of issues are like that and to align yourself with these positions. Or, you, know, you don't have to be very smart to adopt a way of making sense of the world that will reliably connect you to the position that predominates in your group on, in a situation like this. But if you are very good at math, you are very good at argument, you can just do even better. You won't think more like a scientist, you'll just be a more reliable indicator of what people like you happen to think on these issues, right? And now that'll, that'll be very good for you, but it'll be very bad for everybody if we all do this at once, you see, because then in a diverse society, we're less likely to converge on the best available evidence that might be of tremendous significance to our welfare. That doesn't change the incentive of any individual, though, to continue going on in the way that he or she would under these circumstances, because whatever they do individually won't make enough difference. That's a collective action problem. It's a tragedy of the commons. It's a tragedy of the science communication commons. And you know, to fix it, well, you have to, you have to, you have to well, treat this as a, an environmental problem. You see. This is not normal, right? I, I mean, it's not. Th this is normal, right? And, and this is normal. The number of issues, right, where you see the kind of partisan or group affiliation-based division on issues that admit of scientific investigation and that m becomes even more intense as people become more, more science literate, that, th the orders of magnitude fewer of those than there are like the one on top, right? Why? Not because people, well, they're experts on medical x-rays, you know, or, or something like that. We, we need to get the, hey, biologists, tell us something about science communication, because obviously everybody is on, on board with pasteurization of milk, or just about everybody. I mean, there's some people, but they're way out there. There's no cultural conflict. <laughs> no cultural conflict. So everybody must understand pasteurization, right? They don't understand these things. You know, half the people in the United States and that's actually better than most other countries, think that if you take an antibiotic, it kills a virus as well as a, a bacteria. So what? <laughs> they don't need to know that. All they need to know is who the doctor is, and you go to her and you take your erythromycin, you see? You need to accept, in order to live, much more as known by science than you could possibly 
understand or verify for yourself. So you become an expert at knowing who the hell knows what they're talking about. And people are really good at it. One of the reasons they're good at it is they do it in groups like this, you see. <laughs> they, they understand people like them, right? They don't fight with them, right? They, they can read them, you know, they know who's bullshitting, who's telling the truth. So they kind of plug themselves in, they see what people who know what they're talking about are doing, and they get the memo. And that's okay, you see, because science comprehension is a culturally random variable. If you thought one of the groups was stupid, that's just more a cultural cognition, right? They all <laughs> done a study on it, I can show you. Right? <laughs> Manipulations and everything. All these groups are amply stocked with people who know what's known and with mechanisms for transmitting what's known to their members. Because if they weren't, if there's a group out there consistently misleading its members and what's known and that's critical to their welfare, they'd be dead, you see. So they're all good at it. And even though it's a kind of insular strategy, they tend to converge, right? That's normal. This is normal. Did you notice that the, the low numeracy Democrats and Republicans, they don't all have acne? They're listening to their more highly numerate counterparts and getting the memo, right? This is pathological. This occurs when a position on an issue that admits of some science, scientific inquiry takes on some kind of symbolic significance as a kind of marker of somebody's membership in and loyalty to a group. It becomes entangled in these meanings, at which point the stake that people have in forming and persisting in beliefs that connect them to the group will tend to dominate the one that they have in forming truth-convergent understandings. Right? That's not the norm, but it happens. Right? That's a polluted science communication environment. Those meanings that attach to the positions and create a stake for members of these groups in forming positions that are at odds with each other, that make correlation between going with your group and what position you believe in. Those disrupt and disable the normal and normally reliable faculties that people use in an unpolluted science communication environment to figure out what's known. Right? Those include using your critical reasoning capacities, but also your ability to recognize who knows what they're talking about. In a polluted science communication environment, those are no longer reliable. Right? So you've got to protect the science communication environment. Right? There's a science communication environment that consists in the sum total of, of cues and processes that reliably guide people to what's known by science. The, 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 the disruption of those processes by pollutants like these, these antagonistic meanings are as inimical to the welfare of a democratic society as pollutants in the natural environment are to the health of people. And so you have to fix that. You fix that with a, with a policy of science communication environment protection. One that uses, as our environmental protection policy does, evidence-based ways of understanding the kinds of dynamics that affect the science communication environment. Right? I don't know. I said, well, you use these same kinds of, of things I've been talking about to explain the science communication problem to try to fix it. Right? Mitigation strategies. <laughs> But avoid the pollution or detoxify, adaptation. I don't have time. Well, see, this is a trick. <laughs> I, was, I wanted to talk for two hours, but I said, well, I, I won't have time. I'll just, I'll just define the problem and not have time for the solutions. You can ask me about that in questions, right? But, but I would show you studies. We, we, can, use, we can have forecasting, maybe a new technology, like, like nanotechnology. Does it have a future like this? Can we get in front of it? Right? Th this isn't an environment forecasting. Most people don't know about fracking yet. They don't need to know much before they polarize. But we should try to do something if we can. If we, if we can't prevent it from happening, then we have to clean things up. And there are ways to, to clean things up. You want to disentangle the meanings from the position so that people don't have this, this incentive as individuals to form uh, assessments of the information in a way that doesn't fit society's interests in, in the use of truth-convergent strategies. Can you disentangle right? detoxification, adaptation, you see? Because I think <laughs> we're going to be stuck with a, a polluted science communication environment on climate maybe for quite a while, possibly on other issues. But is there something we can do if we understand the mechanisms at work? 
reliably to activate or maybe, maybe supplement the kinds of reasoning dispositions that people usually rely on to figure out what's known. Right? Maybe I can make people curious because if you're curious, you have an appetite to know something you didn't and to be surprised by it. Right? And if you're in that kind of frame, oh, show me. You know, I'm going I'm to love finding out what, what, what I didn't get. Then you're not in this kind of defensive posture. Man, how can we pro promote curiosity or move some of these conversations to places where people are curious? Right? And I could tell you, tell you some things about that too, but there's probably not time about how geoengineering can make people curious and, and reduce polarization. Not enough time, but it also doesn't matter because you know, these are just models really of how you would do something like this. You've got to go out there and you've got you to work at this. You've got to do experiments, reproduce in the field what, what we can see works in the lab. Right? And you know, science communication, environment protection, that's a public good too. Just like protection of the natural environment is. You can't, you know, individuals can't do it. You've you got, you got to have organized action. So, see, this is a, one of the, the themes of the National Academy of Sciences. It's, it's leading the way. Science of science communication. Well, I understand that people use scientific methods to try to understand how it is people come to know what's known. But understand, too, that what we need is a change in, in our social practices. Right? So we don't have this divorce between the knowledge of how people come to know things from the knowledge that science produces and that's used in policy making. Because it's that divorce that caused the problem like climate change, that causes us not to get the value of the knowledge in the HPV vaccine. And you can do things by communicating, you can do, but, but you're members too of institutions. The science, you're, you're a member of a profession that's in a position to do something. You're in a university where you can create programs that bring together the knowledge that's being generated about how to make the world work and how people can reliably be made to know about what's important for their decision making. Right? That will solve the problem if we then apply ourselves to it using methods of science, using reason, right, to, to protect reason from these kinds of challenges to it. Right? Now, the problem is the cats. But of course, I, I don't have time for that. I could tell you about some interesting experiments with cats. Right? <laughs> But that's all I have to have to say, unless people have questions. They aren't very hard. <laughs>